Poems Every Child Should Know, edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 31. Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains just one poem, The Battle of Blenheim. Part 3. Continued. The Battle of Blenheim. Have you been to Woodstock, near Oxford, England? If so, you have seen the palace of the Duke of Marlborough, who won the Battle of Blenheim. The main point of the poem is the doubtful honour in killing in our great wars. Southey, the poet, lived from 1774 to 1843. It was a summer's evening, old Caspar's work was done, and he before his cottage door was sitting in the sun, and by him sported on the green his little grandchild, Wilhelmine. She saw her brother Peterkin roll something large and round, which he, beside the rivulet, in playing there had found. He came to ask what he had found, that was so large and smooth and round. Old Caspar took it from the boy, who stood expectant by, and then the old man shook his head, and, with a natural sigh, "'Tis some poor fellow's skull,' said he, "'who fell in the great victory.' I find them in the garden, for there's many hereabout, and often when I go to plough the ploughshare turns them out. For many thousand men, said he, were slain in that great victory. Now tell us what twas all about, young Peterkin, he cries, and little Wilhelmine looks up with wonder-waiting eyes. Now tell us all about the war, and what they killed each other for. It was the English, Caspar cried, who put the French to rout, but what they killed each other for I could not well make out. But everybody said, quoth he, that twas a famous victory. My father lived at Blenheim then, yon little stream hard by. They burned his dwelling to the ground, and he was forced to fly. So with his wife and child he fled, nor had he where to rest his head. With fire and sword the country round was wasted far and wide, and many a childing mother then and new-born baby died. But things like that, you know, must be, at every famous victory. They say it was a shocking sight after the field was won, for many thousand bodies here lay rotting in the sun. But things like that, you know, must be, after a famous victory. Great praise the Duke of Marlborough won, and our good Prince Eugene. "'Why, t'was a very wicked thing,' said little Wilhelmine. "'Nay, nay, my little girl,' quoth he, "'it was a famous victory.' "'And everybody praised the Duke, who this great fight did win. "'But what good came of it at last?' quoth little Peterkin. "'Why, that I cannot tell,' said he. "'But t'was a famous victory.' Robert Southey End of section 31 Read by Kara Schallenberg, on October 25th, 2006, in Oceanside, California. Every Child Should Know, edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 32, read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains two poems, Fidelity and The Chambered Nautilus. Part three continued. Fidelity. Fidelity by William Wordsworth, seventeen seventy to eighteen fifty, is placed here out of respect to a boy of eleven years who liked the poem well enough to recite it frequently. The scene is laid on Havelin, to me the most impressive mountain of the Lake District of England. Wordsworth is a part of this country. I once heard John Burroughs say. I went to the Lake District to see what kind of a country it could be that would produce a Wordsworth. A barking sound the shepherd hears, a cry as of a dog or fox. He halts and searches with his eyes among the scattered rocks, and now at distance can discern a stirring in a brake of fern, and instantly a dog is seen glancing through that covert green. The dog is not of mountain breed, its motions, too, are wild and shy, with something, as the shepherd thinks, unusual in its cry. Nor is there any one in sight, all round, in hollow, or on height, 
nor shout nor whistle strikes his ear. What is the creature doing here? It was a cove, a huge recess that keeps till June December's snow, a lofty precipice in front, a silent tarn below. Far in the bosom of Havellan, remote from public road or dwelling, pathway or cultivated land, from trace of human foot or hand. There sometimes doth a leaping fish send through the tarn a lonely cheer. The crags repeat the raven's croak in symphony austere. Thither the rainbow comes, the cloud and mists that spread the flying shroud, and sunbeams and the sounding blast that if it could would hurry past, but that enormous barrier binds it fast. Not free from boding thoughts a while the shepherd stood, then makes his way toward the dog, o'er rocks and stones as quickly as he may. Nor far had gone before he found a human skeleton on the ground. The appalled discoverer with a sigh looks round to learn the history. From those abrupt and perilous rocks the man had fallen, that place of fear. At length upon the shepherd's mind it breaks and all is clear. He instantly recalled the name and who he was and whence he came, remembered too the very day on which the traveller passed this way. But here a wonder, for whose sake this lamentable tale I tell. A lasting monument of words, this wonder merits well. The dog, which still was hovering nigh, repeating the same timid cry, the dog had been through three months' space a dweller in that savage place. Yes, proof was plain that since the day when this ill-fated traveller died, the dog had watched about the spot, or by his master's side. How nourished here through such long time he knows who gave that love sublime, and gave that strength of feeling great above all human estimate. William Wordsworth The Chambered Nautilus People are more and more coming to recognize the fact that each individual soul has a right to its own stages of development. The chambered Nautilus is for that reason beloved of the masses. It is one of the grandest poems ever written. Build thee more stately mansions, O my soul. This line alone would make the poem immortal. This is the ship of pearl, which, poets feign, sailed the unshadowed main, the venturous bark that flings on the sweet summer wind its purpled wings, in gulfs enchanted where the siren sings, and coral reefs lie bare, where the cold sea-maids rise to sun their streaming hair. Its webs of living gauze no more unfurl, wrecked is the ship of pearl, and every chambered cell where its dim dreaming life was wont to dwell, as the frail tenant shaped his growing shell, before thee lies revealed, its irised ceiling rent, its sunless crypt unsealed. Year after year beheld the silent toil that spread his lustrous coil. Still as the spiral grew, he left the past year's dwelling for the new. Stole with soft step its shining archway through, built up its idle door. Stretched in his last found home, and knew the old no more. Thanks for the heavenly message brought by thee, child of the wandering sea, cast from her lap forlorn. From thy dead lips a clearer note is born than ever triton blew from wreathed horn. While on my ear it rings, through the deep caves of thought I hear a voice that sings. Build thee more stately mansions, O my soul, as the swift seasons roll. Leave thy low vaulted past. Let each new temple, nobler than the last, shut thee from heaven with a dome more vast, till thou at length art free, leaving thine outgrown shell by life's unresting sea. Oliver Wendell Holmes End of section 32 Read by Kara Schallenberg on October 25th, 2006 in Oceanside, California Every Child Should Know, edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 33, read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains three poems. 
Crossing the Bar, The Overland Mail, and Gathering Song of Donald Dew. Part 3 Continued Crossing the Bar Tennyson's Crossing the Bar is one of the noblest death songs ever written. I include it in this volume out of respect to a young Philadelphia publisher, who recited it one stormy night before the passengers of a ship when I was crossing the Atlantic, and also because so many young people have the good taste to love it. It has been said that next to Browning's Prospice, it is the greatest death song ever written. Sunset and evening star, and one clear call for me, and may there be no moaning of the bar when I put out to sea. But such a tide as moving seems asleep, too full for sound and foam, when that which drew from out the boundless deep turns again home. Twilight and evening bell, and after that the dark, and may there be no sadness of farewell when I embark. For though from out our born of time and place the flood may bear me far, I hope to see my pilot face to face when I have crossed the bar. Alfred Tennyson The Overland Mail The Overland Mail is a most desirable poem for children to learn. When one boy learns it, the others want to follow. It takes as a hero the man who gives common service, the one who does not lead or command, but follows the line of duty. In the name of the Empress of India, make way, O lords of the jungle, wherever you roam. The woods are astir at the close of the day. We exiles are waiting for letters from home. Let the robber retreat, let the tiger turn tail. In the name of the Empress, the Overland Mail. With a jingle of bells, as the dusk gathers in, he turns to the footpath that leads up the hill. The bag's on his back and a cloth round his chin, and tucked in his belt, the post-office bill. Dispatched on this date, as received by the rail, per runner, two bags of the overland mail. Is the torrent in spate? He must ford it or swim. Has the rain wrecked the road? He must climb by the cliff. Does the tempest cry, Halt! What are tempests to him? The service admits not a but or an if. While the breath's in his mouth, he must bear without fail, in the name of the Empress, the Overland Mail. From aloe to rose oak, from rose oak to fir, from level to upland, from upland to crest, from rice field to rock ridge, from rock ridge to spur, fly the soft sandaled feet, strains the brawny brown chest. From rail to ravine, to the peak from the vale, up, up through the night, goes the Overland Mail. There's a speck on the hillside, a dot on the road, a jingle of bells on the footpath below. There's a scuffle above in the monkey's abode. The world is awake, and the clouds are aglow. For the great sun himself must attend to the hail. In the name of the Empress, the Overland Mail. Rudyard Kipling Gathering Song of Donald Dew John, do you remember when you used to spout Pybrock of Doniel Dew? I think you were ten years old. Sir Walter Scott's men all have a genius for standing up to their guns, and boys gather up the man's genius when reciting his verse. Pybrock of Doniel Dew, Pybrock of Doniel, wake thy wild voice anew, summon Clan Conuel. Come away, come away, hark to the summons, come in your war array, gentles and commons. Come from deep glen, and from mountain so rocky, the war-pipe and pennon are at Inverlochy. Come every hill-plaid, and true heart that wears one, come every steel-blade, and strong hand that bears one. Leave untended the herd, the flock without shelter, leave the corpse uninterred, the bride at the altar. Leave the deer, leave the steer, leave nets and barges. Come with your fighting gear, broadswords and targes. Come as the winds come, when forests are rended. Come as the waves come, when navies are stranded. Faster come, faster come, faster and faster. Chief, vassal, page and groom, tenant and master. 
Fast they come, fast they come, see how they gather. Wide waves the eagle plume, blended with heather. Cast your plaids, draw your blades, forward each man set. Pibroch of Daniel Dew, knell for the onset. Sir Walter Scott End of section 33 Read by Kara Schallenberg on October 25th, 2006 In Oceanside, California Poems Every Child Should Know Edited by Mary E. Burt Section 34 Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg This section contains just one poem Marco Bozaris Part three continued. Marco Bozaris. Marco Bozaris by Fitzgreen Halleck, seventeen ninety to eighteen sixty seven, was in my old school reader. Boys and girls liked it then, and they like it now. This is another of the poems that was not born to die. At midnight in his guarded tent, the Turk was dreaming of the hour when Greece her knee in suppliants bent, should tremble at his power. In dreams through camp and court he bore the trophies of a conqueror. In dreams his song of triumph heard, then wore his monarch's signet ring, then pressed that monarch's throne, a king, as wild his thoughts and gay of wing as Eden's garden bird. At midnight in the forest shades Bozaris ranged his Suliot band, True as the steel of their tried blades, Heroes in heart and hand. There had the Persians thousands stood, There had the glad earth drunk their blood, On old Plataea's day. And now there breathed that haunted air The sons of sires who conquered there, With arm to strike and soul to dare, As quick, as far as they. An hour passed on, the Turk awoke, That bright dream was his last, he woke to hear his sentries shriek, To arms! They come! The Greek! The Greek! He woke to die midst flame and smoke, And shout and groan and sabre stroke, And death shots falling thick and fast As lightnings from the mountain cloud, And heard with voice as trumpet loud Bozaris cheer his band. Strike till the last armed foe expires, Strike for your altars and your fires, Strike for the green graves of your sires, God and your native land. They fought like brave men long and well, They plied that ground with Moslem slain, They conquered, but Bozaris fell, Bleeding at every vein. His few surviving comrades saw his smile When rang their proud hurrah, And the red field was won. Then saw in death his eyelids close, Calmly as to a night's repose, like flowers at set of sun. Come to the bridal chamber, death, come to the mother's when she feels for the first time her firstborn's breath. Come when the blessed seals that close the pestilence are broke, and crowded cities wail its stroke. Come in consumption's ghastly form, the earthquake shock, the ocean storm. Come when the heart beats high and warm with banquet song and dance and wine, and thou art terrible, the tear, the groan, the knell, the pall, the beer, And all we know or dream or fear of agony are thine. But to the hero, when his sword has won the battle for the free, Thy voice sounds like a prophet's word, And in its hollow tones are heard the thanks of millions yet to be. Come when his task of fame is wrought, Come with her laurel leaf, blood bought, Come in her crowning hour, and then thy sunken eyes' unearthly light To him is welcome as the sight of sky and stars to prisoned men. Thy grasp is welcome as the hand of brother in a foreign land. Thy summons welcome as the cry that told the Indian Isles were nigh To the world-seeking Genoese. When the land-wind from woods of palm and orange groves and fields of balm Blue o'er the Haitian seas. Bozaris, with the storied brave, Greece nurtured in her glory's time, Rest thee, there is no prouder grave, Even in her own proud clime. She wore no funeral weeds for thee, Nor bade the dark hearse wave its plume, 
like torn branch from death's leafless tree, in sorrow's pomp and pageantry. The heartless luxury of the tomb, but she remembers thee as one, long loved and for a season gone. For thee her poet's lyre is wreathed, her marble wrought, her music breathed. For thee she rings the birthday bells, of thee her babe's first lisping tells. For thine her evening prayer is said at palace couch and cottage bed. Her soldier, closing with the foe, gives for thy sake a deadlier blow. His plighted maiden, when she fears for him the joy of her young years, thinks of thy fate and checks her tears. And she, the mother of thy boys, though in her eye and faded cheek is read the grief, she will not speak, the memory of her buried joys. And even she, who gave thee birth, will by their pilgrim-circled hearth talk of thy doom without a sigh. For thou art freedoms now and fames, one of the few, the immortal names that were not born to die. Fitzgreen Halleck. End of section thirty four. Read by Kara Schallenberg on October twenty fifth, two thousand six, in Oceanside, California. Every Child Should Know. Edited by Mary E. Burt. Section thirty five. Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains the following poems. The Death of Napoleon, How Sleep the Brave, The Flag Goes By, Hohenlinden, and My Old Kentucky Home. Part 3. Continued. The Death of Napoleon. The Death of Napoleon by Isaac McClellan, 1806-1899, was yet another of the good old reader songs taught us by a teacher of good taste. We love those teachers more, the older we grow. Wild was the night, yet a wilder night hung round the soldier's pillow. In his bosom there waged a fiercer fight than the fight on the wrathful billow. A few fond mourners were kneeling by, the few that his stern heart cherished, they knew, by his glazed and unearthly eye, that life had nearly perished. They knew, by his awful and kingly look, by the order hastily spoken, that he dreamed of days when the nations shook, and the nation's hosts were broken. He dreamed that the Frenchman's sword still slew, and triumphed the Frenchman's eagle, and the struggling Austrian fled anew like the hare before the beagle. The bearded Russian he scourged again, the Prussian's camp was routed, and again on the hills of haughty Spain his mighty armies shouted. Over Egypt's sands, over Alpine snows, at the pyramids at the mountain, where the wave of the lordly Danube flows, and by the Italian fountain. On the snowy cliffs where mountain streams dash by the Switzer's dwelling, he led again in his dying dreams his hosts, the proud earth quelling. Again Marengo's field was won, and Gina's bloody battle. Again the world was overrun, made pale at his cannon's rattle. He died at the close of that darksome day, a day that shall live in story. In the rocky land they placed his clay, and left him alone with his glory. Isaac McClellan How Sleep the Brave how sleep the brave who sink to rest, By all their country's wishes blest, When spring with dewy fingers cold Returns to deck their hallowed mould, She there shall dress a sweeter sod Than fancy's feet have ever trod. By fairy hands their knell is rung, By forms unseen their dirges sung. There honour comes, a pilgrim grey, To bless the turf that wraps their clay, And freedom shall a while repair, to dwell a weeping hermit there. William Collins The Flag Goes By The Flag Goes By is included out of regard to a boy of eleven years who pleased me by his great appreciation of it. It teaches the lesson of reverence to our great national symbol. It is published by permission of the author, Henry Holcomb Bennett, of Ohio. Hats off! Along the street there comes a blare of bugles, a ruffle of drums, a flash of colour beneath the sky. Hats off! The flag is passing by. 
Blue and crimson and white it shines over the steel-tipped ordered lines. Hats off, the colors before us fly, but more than the flag is passing by. Sea fights and land fights, grim and great, fought to make and to save the state. Weary marches and sinking ships, cheers of victory on dying lips. Days of plenty and years of peace, march of a strong land's swift increase. Equal justice, right and law, stately honor and reverend awe. Sign of a nation, great and strong, toward her people from foreign wrong. Pride and glory and honor, all live in the colors to stand or fall. Hats off, along the street there comes a blare of bugles, a ruffle of drums. And loyal hearts are beating high. Hats off, the flag is passing by. Henry Holcomb Bennett Hohenlinden On Linden, when the sun was low, All bloodless lay the untrodden snow, And dark as winter was the flow of Iser, Rolling rapidly. But Linden saw another sight, When the drum beat at dead of night, Commanding fires of death to light The darkness of her scenery. By torch and trumpet fast arrayed, Each horseman drew his battle-blade, and furious every charger neighed to join the dreadful revelry. Then shook the hills with thunder riven, then rushed the steed to battle driven, and louder than the bolts of heaven far flashed the red artillery. But redder yet that light shall glow on Linden's hills or stained snow, and bloodier yet the torrent flow of Iser rolling rapidly. "'Tis morn, but scarce yon level sun "'can pierce the war-clouds rolling dun, "'where furious Frank and fiery Hun "'shout in their sulphurous canopy. "'The combat deepens on, ye brave, "'who rush to glory o'er the grave. "'Wave, Munich, all thy banners wave, "'and charge with all thy chivalry. "'Few, few shall part where many meet. "'The snow shall be their winding-sheet.' and every turf beneath their feet shall be a soldier's sepulchre. Thomas Campbell My Old Kentucky Home The sun shines bright in the old Kentucky home, tis summer, the darkies are gay, the corn-tops ripe and the meadows in the bloom, while the birds make music all the day. The young folks roll on the little cabin floor, all merry, all happy and bright. By and by hard times comes a-knockin' at the door. Then, my old Kentucky home, good night. Weep no more, my lady, oh, weep no more to-day. We will sing one song for the old Kentucky home, for the old Kentucky home far away. They hunt no more for the possum and the coon, on the meadow, the hill, and the shore. They sing no more by the glimmer of the moon, on the bench by the old cabin door. The day goes by like a shadow o'er the heart, with sorrow where all was delight. The time has come when the darkies have to part, then, my old Kentucky home, good night. The head must bow, and the back will have to bend, wherever the darky may go. A few more days, and the trouble all will end, in the field where the sugar canes grow. A few more days, for to tote the weary load, no matter, t'will never be light. A few more days till we totter on the road. Then, my old Kentucky home, good night. Weep no more, my lady, oh, weep no more to-day. We will sing one song for the old Kentucky home, for the old Kentucky home far away. Stephen Collins Foster End of section 35 Read by Kara Schallenberg on October 25th, 2006, in Oceanside, California. Poems Every Child Should Know Edited by Mary E. Burt Section 36 Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg This section contains two poems, Old Folks at Home and The Wreck of the Hesperus. Part 3 Continued Old Folks at Home Way down upon the Swanee River, far, far away, There's where my heart is turning ever, There's where the old folks stay. All up and down the whole creation, sadly I roam, 
still longing for de old plantation and for de old folks at home all the world am sad and dreary everywhere i roam oh darkies how my heart grows weary far from de old folks at home all round a little farm i wandered when i was young then many happy days i squandered many de songs i sung when i was playing with my brother happy was i Oh, take me to my kind old mother, there let me live and die. One little hut among the bushes, one that I love, still sadly to my memory rushes, no matter where I rove. When will I see the bees a humming all round the comb? When will I hear the banjo tumming down in my good old home? All the world am sad and dreary, everywhere I roam. Oh, darkies, how my heart grows weary, far from de old folks at home. Stephen Collins Foster The Wreck of the Hesperus The Wreck of the Hesperus by Longfellow, 1807-1882, to on Norman's Woe off the coast near Cape Ann, is a historic poem as well as an imaginative composition. It was the schooner Hesperus that sailed the wintry sea, and the skipper had taken his little daughter to bear him company. Blue were her eyes as the fairy flax, her cheeks like the dawn of day, and her bosom white as the hawthorn buds that ope in the month of May. The skipper he stood beside the helm, his pipe was in his mouth, and he watched how the veering flaw did blow, the smoke now west, now south. Then up and spake an old sailor, had sailed the Spanish main. I pray thee, put into yonder port, for I fear a hurricane. Last night the moon had a golden ring, and to-night no moon we see. The skipper he blew a whiff from his pipe, and a scornful laugh laughed he. Colder and louder blew the wind, a gale from the northeast. The snow fell hissing in the brine, and the billows frothed like yeast. Down came the storm, and smote amain the vessel in its strength. She shuddered and paused, like a frightened steed, then leaped her cable's length. "'Come hither, come hither, my little daughter, and do not tremble so, for I can weather the roughest gale that ever wind did blow.' He wrapped her warm in his seaman's cloak, against the stinging blast. He cut a rope from a broken spar, and bound her to the mast." O oh, father, I hear the church bells ring. O oh, say, what may it be? Tis a fog bell on a rock-bound coast, and he steered for the open sea. O oh, father, I hear the sound of guns. O oh, say, what may it be? Some ship in distress that cannot live in such an angry sea. O oh, father, I see a gleaming light. O oh, say, what may it be? But the father answered never a word. A frozen corpse was he. Lashed to the helm, all stiff and stark, with his face turned to the skies, the lantern gleamed through the gleaming snow on his fixed and glassy eyes. Then the maiden clasped her hands and prayed that saved she might be, and she thought of Christ who stilled the wave on the lake of Galilee. And fast through the midnight dark and drear, through the whistling sleet and snow, like a sheeted ghost the vessel swept toward the reef of Norman's woe. And ever the fitful gusts between a sound came from the land. It was the sound of the trampling surf on the rocks and the hard sea-sand. The breakers were right beneath her bows. She drifted a dreary wreck. And a whooping billow swept the crew like icicles from her deck. She struck where the white and fleecy waves looked soft as carded wool, but the cruel rocks they gored her side like the horns of an angry bull. Her rattling shrouds all sheathed in ice, with the masts went by the board. Like a vessel of glass she stove and sank, ho, ho, the breakers roared. At daybreak on the bleak sea-beach a fisherman stood aghast to see the form of a maiden fair, lashed close to a drifting mast. The salt sea was frozen on her breast, the salt tears in her eyes, 
and he saw her hair like the brown seaweed on the billows fall and rise. Such was the wreck of the Hesperus in the midnight and the snow. Christ save us all from a death like this on the reef of Norman's woe. Henry W. Longfellow End of section 36 Read by Kara Schallenberg on October 26, 2006 in Oceanside, California. Poems Every Child Should Know Edited by Mary E. Burt Section 37 Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg This section contains two poems, Robert Bruce's Address to His Army and The Inchcape Rock. Part 3 continued Bannockburn, Robert Bruce's Address to His Army you can look down on the battlefield of Bannockburn from Stirling Castle, Scotland, near which stands a magnificent statue of Robert the Bruce. How often have I trodden over the old battlefield! The monument of William Wallace, too, looms up on the Ockle Hills, not far away. Scots, where hey we Wallace bled, Scots, where Bruce has often led, welcome to your gory bed, or to victory. Now's the day, and now's the hour, see the front a battle lower, see approach proud Edward's power, chains and slavery. Wha will be a traitor knave, wha can fill a coward's grave, wha say base as be a slave, let him turn and flee. Wha for Scotland's king and law, freedom's sword will strongly draw, free man stand, or free man fa, let him follow me. By oppression's woes and pains, be your sons in servile chains, we will drain our dearest veins, but they shall be free. Lay the proud usurpers low, tyrants fall in every foe, liberties in every blow, let us do or die. Robert Burns Part 4. Lad and Lassie The Inchcape Rock the man is wrecked, and his ship is sunken, before he ever steps on board or sees the water, if his heart is hard and his estimate of human beings low. The Inchcape Rock is a thrust at hard-heartedness. What is the use of life? To bear one another's burdens, to develop a genius for pulling people through hard places, that's the use of life. It is the last resort of a mean mind to crack jokes that wreck innocent voyagers on life's sea. No stir in the air, no stir in the sea, the ship was still as she could be. Her sails from heaven received no motion, her keel was steady in the ocean. Without either sign or sound of their shock, the waves flowed over the Inchcape Rock. So little they rose, so little they fell, they did not move the Inchcape Bell. The abbot of Aberbrothock had placed that bell on the Inchcape Rock. On a buoy in the storm it floated and swung, and over the waves its warning rung. When the rock was hid by the surge's swell, the mariners heard the warning bell, and then they knew the perilous rock, and blessed the abbot of Aberbrothock. The sun in heaven was shining gay, all things were joyful on that day. The sea-birds screamed as they wheeled round, and there was joyance in their sound. The boy of the Inchcape bell was seen, a dark spot on the ocean green. Sir Ralph the rover walked his deck, and he fixed his eye on the darker speck. He felt the cheering power of spring, it made him whistle, it made him sing. His heart was mirthful to excess, but the rover's mirth was wickedness. His eye was on the Inchcape float, quoth he, My men put out the boat, and row me to the Inchcape rock, and I'll plague the abbot of Aberbrothock. The boat is lowered, the boatmen row, and to the Inchcape Rock they go. Sir Ralph bent over from the boat, and he cut the bell from the Inchcape float. Down sank the bell with a gurgling sound, the bubbles rose and burst around. Quoth Sir Ralph, the next who comes to the rock won't bless the abbot of Aberbrothock. 
Sir Ralph the rover sailed away, he scoured the sea for many a day, and now grown rich with plundered store, he steers his course for Scotland's shore. So thick a haze o'erspread the sky, they cannot see the sun on high. The wind hath blown a gale all day, at evening it hath died away. On the deck the rover takes his stand, so dark it is they see no land. Quoth Sir Ralph, it will be brighter soon, for there is the dawn of the rising moon. Canst hear, said one, the broken roar, for methinks we should be near the shore. Now where we are I cannot tell, but I wish I could hear the Inchcape bell. They hear no sound, the swell is strong, though the wind hath fallen they drift along, till the vessel strikes with a shivering shock. O oh, Christ, it is the Inchcape rock! Sir Ralph the rover tore his hair, he cursed himself in his despair. The waves rush in on every side, the ship is sinking beneath the tide. But even in his dying fear, one dreadful sound could the rover hear, a sound as if with the Inchcape bell, the devil below was ringing his knell. Robert Southey End of section 37 Read by Kara Schallenberg on October 26, 2006, in Oceanside, California. Poems Every Child Should Know Edited by Mary E. Burt Section 38 Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg This section contains two poems, The Finding of the Liar and A Chrysalis. Part four continued. The Finding of the Lyre. Once a year my pupils teach me the finding of the lyre. By the time I have learned it, they know the meaning of every line, and have caught the spirit of the verse. There is an ancient lyre, or violin, made in northern Africa, in the possession of a Boston lady, and I have found the mud-turtle rattle among the Indians on the Indian reservation at Syracuse, New York. They use it as a musical instrument in their thanksgiving dances. The poem helps to build an interest in history and mythology, while it develops a child's reverence and insight. There lay upon the ocean's shore what once a tortoise served to cover. A year and more, with rush and roar, the surf had rolled it over, had played with it and flung it by, as wind and weather might decide it, then tossed it high where sand drifts dry, cheap burial might provide it. It rested there to bleach or tan, the rains had soaked, the sun had burned it. With many a ban the fisherman had stumbled o'er and spurned it. And there the fisher-girl would stay, conjecturing with her brother, how in their play the poor estray might serve some use or other. So there it lay, through wet and dry, as empty as the last new sonnet, till by and by came Mercury, and, having mused upon it, Why, here, cried he, the thing of things, in shape, material, and dimension. Give it but strings, and, lo, it sings, a wonderful invention. So said, so done, the chords he strained, and as his fingers o'er them hovered, the shell disdained a soul had gained, the lyre had been discovered. O empty world that round us lies, dead shell of soul and thought forsaken, brought we but eyes like Mercury's, in thee what songs should waken. James Russell Lowell A Chrysalis A Chrysalis is a favourite poem with John Burroughs, and is found too in Stedman's collection. We all come to a point in life where we need to burst the shell and fly away into the new realm. My little maidchen found one day a curious something in her play, that was not fruit, nor flower, nor seed, it was not anything that grew, or crept, or climbed, or swam, or flew, had neither legs nor wings indeed, and yet she was not sure, she said, whether it was alive or dead. She brought it in her tiny hand, to see if I would understand, and wondered when I made reply, "'You found a baby butterfly.' "'A butterfly is not like this,' with doubtful look she answered me. 
so then i told her what would be some day within the chrysalis how slowly in the dull brown thing now still as death a spotted wing and then another would unfold till from the empty shell would fly a pretty creature by and by all radiant in blue and gold and will it truly questioned she her laughing lips and eager eyes all in a sparkle of surprise and shall your little maiden see she shall i said how could i tell that ere the worm within its shell its gauzy splendid wings had spread my little maiden would be dead to-day the butterfly has flown she was not here to see it fly and sorrowing i wonder why the empty shell is mine alone perhaps the secret lies in this i too had found a chrysalis and death that robbed me of delight was but the radiant creature's flight mary emily bradley end of section 38 read by kara schallenberg on october 26 2006 in oceanside california Poems Every Child Should Know, edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 39, read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains two poems. For All That and All That, and A New Arrival. Part 4 continued. For All That. Robert Burns, the plowman and poet, dinnered wi' a lord. The story goes that he was put at the second table. That lord is dead, but Robert Burns still lives. He is immortal. It is the survival of the fittest, for Ah That and Ah That is a poem that wipes out the superficial value put on money and other externalities. This poem is more valuable in education than good penmanship or good spelling. There are a couple of footnotes to this poem. I'll read them first. The word... Hodden gray means coarse woolen clothes. A burkey is an impudent fellow, and a coof is a fool or blockhead. Is there for honest poverty that hangs his head, and ah that, the coward slave we pass him by, we dare be poor for ah that. For ah that, and ah that, our toils obscure, and ah that, the rank is but the guinea's stamp. The man's the gowd for a' that. What though on Hamley Fair we dine, Wear hodden grey, and a' that, Give fools their silks, and knaves their wine, A man's a man for a' that. For a' that, and a' that, Their tinsel show, and a' that, The honest man, though e'er so poor, Is king o' men for a' that. Ye see yon Berkey, cad a lord, Wha struts and stares, and a' that, Though hundreds worship at his word, he's but a coof for a' that. For a' that, and a' that, his ribbon star, and a' that, the man of independent mind, he looks and laughs at a' that. A prince can make a belted knight, a marquis duke, and a' that, but an honest man's aboon his might, good faith he mauna for that. For a' that, and a' that, their dignities, and a' that, the pith o' sense and pride o' worth are higher rank than a' that. Then let us pray that come it may and come it will for a' that, that sense and worth o'er all the earth may bear the gree and a' that. For a' that and a' that, it's coming yet for a' that, that man to man the world o'er shall brothers be for a' that. Robert Burns a new arrival the new arrival is a valuable poem because it expresses the joy of a young father over his new baby if girls should be educated to be good mothers so should boys be taught that fatherhood is the highest and holiest joy and right of man the child is educator to the man he teaches him how to take responsibility how to give unbiased judgments and how to be fatherly like our father who is in heaven there came to port last Sunday night the queerest little craft, 
Without an inch of rigging on, I looked and looked and laughed. It seemed so curious that she should cross the unknown water, and moor herself right in my room, my daughter, oh, my daughter. Yet by these presents witness all she's welcome fifty times, and comes consigned to hope and love, and common meter rhymes. She has no manifest but this, no flag floats o'er the water. She's too new for the British Lloyds, my daughter, oh, my daughter. Ring out, wild bells, and tame ones, too, ring out the lover's moon. Ring in the little worsted socks, ring in the bib and spoon. Ring out the muse, ring in the nurse, ring in the milk and water. Away with paper, pen, and ink, my daughter, oh, my daughter. George W. Cable End of section 39 Read by Kara Schallenberg on October 26, 2006 In Oceanside, California Poems Every Child Should Know Edited by Mary E. Burt Part 40 Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg This section contains two poems, The Brook and The Ballad of the Clamperdown. Part 4 Continued The Brook Tennyson's The Brook is included out of love to a dear old schoolmate in Colorado. The real brook, near Cambridge, England, is tame, compared to your Colorado streams, O oh beloved comrade. This poem is well liked by the majority of pupils. I chatter, chatter, as I flow, to join the brimming river, for men may come and men may go, but I go on for ever. I wind about, and in and out, with here a blossom sailing, and here and there a lusty trout, and here and there a grayling. I steal by lawns and grassy plots, I slide by hazel covers, I move the sweet forget-me-nots that grow for happy lovers. I slip, I slide, I glue my glance among my skimming swallows, I make the netted sunbeams dance against my sandy shallows. I murmur under moon and stars in brambly wildernesses, I linger by my shingly bars, I loiter round my cresses, and out again I curve and flow to join the brimming river, for men may come and men may go, but I go on for ever. Alfred Tennyson The Ballad of the Clamperdown The Ballad of the Clamperdown, by Rudyard Kipling, is included because my boys always like it. It needs a great deal of explanation, and few boys will hold out to the end in learning it. But it pays. It was our warship, clamper down, would sweep the channel clean, wherefore she kept her hatches close, when the merry channel chops arose to save the bleached marine. She had one bow gun of a hundred ton, and a great stern gun beside. They dipped their noses deep in the sea, they racked their stays and stanchions free, in the wash of the wind-whipped tide. It was our warship, clamper down, fell in with a cruiser light, that carried the dainty Hotchkiss gun, and a pair of heels wherewith to run, from the grip of a close-fought fight. She opened fire at seven miles, as ye shoot at a bobbing cork, and once she fired, and twice she fired, till the bow-gun grouped like a lily tired that lolls upon the stalk. Captain, the bow-gun melts apace, the deck-beams break below. Twere well to rest for an hour or twain, and botch the shattered plates again. And he answered, Make it so. She opened fire within the mile, as ye shoot at the flying duck and the great stern-gun shot fair and true, with the heave of the ship to the stainless blue, and the great stern-turret struck. Captain, the turret fills with steam, the feed-pipes burst below. You can hear the hiss of helpless ram, you can hear the twisted runners jam. And he answered, Turn and go. It was our warship, clamper down, and grimly did she roll, 
swung round to take the cruiser's fire as the white whale faces the thresher's ire when they war by the frozen pole captain the shells are falling fast and faster still fall we and it is not meet for english stock to bide in the heart of an eight-day clock the death they cannot see lie down lie down my bold a b we drift upon her beam we dare not ram, for she can run, and dare you fire another gun, and die in the peeling stream? It was our warship, clamper down, that carried an armor belt, but fifty feet at stern and bow lay bare as the paunch of the purser's sow, to the hail of the Norden felt. Captain, they lack us through and through, the chilled steel bolts are swift, we have emptied the bunkers in open sea, their shrapnel bursts where our coal should be, and he answered, Let her drift. It was our warship, clamper down, swung round upon the tide. Her two dumb guns glared south and north, and the blood and the bubbling stream ran forth, and she ground the cruiser's side. Captain, they cry the fight is done, they bid you send your sword. And he answered, Grapple her stern and bow, they have asked for the steel, they shall have it now. Out, cutlasses, and board! It was our warship, clamper down, spewed up four hundred men, and the scalded stokers yelped delight as they rolled in the waist and heard the fight stamp o'er their steel-walled pen. They cleared the cruiser end to end, from conning tower to hold. They fought as they fought in Nelson's fleet, they were stripped to the waist, they were bare to the feet, as it was in the days of old. It was the sinking clamper down, heaved up her battered side, and carried a million pounds in steel to the cod and the corpse-fed conger eel, and the scour of the channel tide. It was the crew of the clamper down stood out to sweep the sea, on a cruiser won from an ancient foe, as it was in the days of long ago, and as it still shall be. Rudyard Kipling End of section 40. Read by Kara Schallenberg on October 29, 2006, in Oceanside, California. Poems Every Child Should Know. Edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 41. Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains the following poems. The Destruction of Sennacherib, I Remember, I Remember, and Driving Home the Cows. Part 4 continued. The Destruction of Sennacherib. The Destruction of Sennacherib by Lord Byron finds a place in this collection because Johnny, a ten-year-old, and many of his friends say, It's great. The Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold, and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold, and the sheen of their spears was like stars on the sea, when the blue wave rolls nightly on deep Galilee. Like the leaves of the forest when the summer is green, that host with their banners at sunset were seen, like the leaves of the forest when autumn hath blown, that host on the morrow lay withered and strown. For the angel of death spread his wings on the blast, and breathed in the face of the foe as he passed, and the eyes of the sleepers waxed deadly and chill, and their hearts but once heaved, and for ever grew still. And there lay the steed, with his nostril all wide, but through it there rolled not the breath of his pride, and the foam of his gasping lay white on the turf, and cold as the spray of the rock-beating surf. And there lay the rider, distorted and pale, with the dew on his brow and the rust on his mail, and the tents were all silent, the banners alone, the lances unlifted, the trumpet unblown. And the widows of Asher are loud in their wail, and the idols are broke in the temple of Baal, and the might of the Gentile, unsmote by the sword, hath melted like snow in the glance of the Lord. Lord Byron I remember, I remember. I remember, I remember, the house where I was born, the little window where the sun came peeping in at morn. 
He never came a wink too soon, nor brought too long a day, but now I often wish the night had borne my breath away. I remember, I remember, the roses red and white, the violets and the lily cups, those flowers made of light, the lilacs where the robin built, and where my brother set the laburnum on his birthday, the tree is living yet. I remember, I remember, where I was used to swing, and thought the air must rush as fresh to swallows on the wing. My spirit flew in feathers then, that is so heavy now, and summer pools could hardly cool the fever on my brow. I remember, I remember, the fir-trees dark and high. I used to think their slender tops were close against the sky. It was a childish ignorance, but now tis little joy, to know I'm farther off from heaven than when I was a boy. Thomas Hood Driving Home the Cows out of the clover and blue-eyed grass he turned them into the river lane. One after another he let them pass, then fastened the meadow bars again. Under the willows and over the hill he patiently followed their sober pace. The merry whistle for once was still, and something shadowed the sunny face. Only a boy, and his father had said he never could let his youngest go— Two already were lying dead under the feet of the trampling foe. But after the evening work was done, and the frogs were loud in the meadow swamp, over his shoulder he slung his gun, and stealthily followed the footpath damp. Across the clover and through the wheat, with resolute heart and purpose grim, though the dew was on his hurrying feet, and the blind bat's flitting startled him. Thrice since then had the lanes been white, and the orchards sweet with apple-bloom, and now, when the cows came back at night, the feeble father drove them home. For news had come to the lonely farm that three were lying where two had lain, and the old man's tremulous palsied arm could never lean on a son's again. The summer day grew cool and late. He went for the cows when the work was done, but down the lane, as he opened the gate, he saw them coming one by one. Brindle, Ebony, Speckle, and Bess, shaking their horns in the evening wind, cropping the buttercups out of the grass, but who was it following close behind? Loosely swung in the idle air the empty sleeve of army blue, and worn and pale from the crisping hair looked out a face that the father knew. For close-barred prisons will sometimes yawn and yield their dead unto life again, and the day that comes with a cloudy dawn in golden glory at last may wane. The great tears sprang to their meeting eyes, for the heart must speak when the lips are dumb, and under the silent evening skies, together they followed the cattle home. Kate Putnam Osgood End of section 41. Read by Kara Schallenberg on October 29th, 2006, in Oceanside, California. Poems Every Child Should Know. Edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 42. Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains two poems. Crinken and... STEVENSON'S BIRTHDAY Part 4 continued Crinken Crinken is the dearest of poems. Crinken was a little child, it was summer when he smiled. Eugene Field, above all other poets, paid the finest tribute to children. This poet only could make the whole ocean warm, because a child's heart was there to warm it. Crinken was a little child, it was summer when he smiled, Oft the hoary sea and grim stretched its white arms out to him, calling, Sun-child, come to me, let me warm my heart with thee. But the child heard not the sea, calling yearning evermore for the summer on the shore. Crinken on the beach one day saw a maiden, niece, at play. On the pebbly beach she played, in the summer Crinken made. Fair and very fair was she, just a little child was he. 
Crinken, said the maiden, Nis, let me have a little kiss. Just a kiss and go with me to the summer lands that be down within the silver sea. Crinken was a little child, by the maiden Nis beguiled. Hand in hand with her went he, and twas summer in the sea. And the hoary sea and grim to its bosom folded him, clasped and kissed the little form, and the ocean's heart was warm. Now the sea calls out no more, it is winter on the shore, winter where that little child made sweet summer when he smiled, though tis summer on the sea, where with maiden Nis went he, it is winter on the shore, winter, winter, evermore. Of the summer on the deep come sweet visions in my sleep, his fair face lifts from the sea, his dear voice calls out to me, these my dreams of summer be. Crinken was a little child, by the maiden Nis beguiled. Oft the hoary sea and grim reached its longing arms to him, crying, Sim, child, come to me, let me warm my heart with thee. But the sea calls out no more, it is winter on the shore, winter cold and dark and wild. Crinken was a little child, it was summer when he smiled. Down he went into the sea, and the winter bides with me. Just a little child was he. Eugene Field Stevenson's Birthday How I should like a birthday, said the child. I have so few, and they so far apart. She spoke to Stevenson. The master smiled. Mine is to-day. I would with all my heart that it were yours. Too many years have I. Too swift they come, and all too swiftly fly. So, by a formal deed, he there conveyed all right and title in his natal day, to have and hold, to sell or give away, then signed, and gave it to the little maid. Joyful, yet fearing to believe too much, she took the deed, but scarcely dared unfold. Ah, liberal genius, at whose potent touch all common things shine with transmuted gold! A day of Stevenson's will prove to be not part of time, but immortality. Catherine Miller. End of section forty two. Read by Kara Schallenberg on October twenty ninth, two thousand six, in Oceanside, California. Poems Every Child Should Know. Edited by Mary E. Burt. Section forty three. Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains two poems, A Modest Wit and The Legend of Bishop Hatto. Part 4 continued. A Modest Wit I learned a modest wit as a reading lesson when I was a child. It has clung to me, and so I cling to it. It is just as good as it ever was. It is a sharp thrust at power that depends on externalities. Selleck Osborne a supercilious nabob of the East, haughty being great, purse-proud being rich, a governor or general at the least, I have forgotten which, had in his family a humble youth, who went from England in his patron's suit, an unassuming boy in truth, a lad of decent parts, and good repute. This youth had sense and spirit, but yet with all his sense, excessive diffidence obscured his merit. One day, at table, flushed with pride and wine, his honour, proudly free, severely merry, conceived it would be vastly fine to crack a joke upon his secretary. "'Young man,' he said, "'by what art, craft, or trade did your good father gain a livelihood?' "'He was a saddler, sir,' Modestus said, "'and in his time was reckoned good.' "'A saddler, eh?' and taught you Greek, instead of teaching you to sew? Pray, why did not your father make a saddler, sir, of you? Each parasite, then, as in duty bound, the joke applauded, and the laugh went round. At length Modestus, bowing low, said, craving pardon, if too free he made, Sir, by your leave, I fain would know your father's trade. 
"'My father's trade, by heaven, that's too bad. "'My father's trade, why, blockhead, are you mad? "'My father, sir, did never stoop so low. "'He was a gentleman, I'd have you know.' "'Excuse the liberty I take,' Modestus said, "'with archness on his brow. "'Pray, why did not your father make a gentleman of you?' Selick Osborne THE LEGEND OF BISHOP HATTO The legend of Bishop Hatto is doubtless a myth. Robert Southey, 1774-1843 But the Mouse Tower on the Rhine is an object of interest to travellers, and the story has a point. The summer and autumn had been so wet, that in winter the corn was growing yet. T'was a piteous sight to see, all around, the grain lie rotting on the ground. Every day the starving poor crowded around Bishop Hatto's door, for he had a plentiful last year's store, and all the neighborhood could tell his granaries were furnished well. At last Bishop Hatto appointed a day to quiet the poor without delay. He bade them to his great barn repair, and they should have food for winter there. Rejoiced such tidings good to hear, the poor folk flocked from far and near, the great barn was full as it could hold of women and children, young and old. Then, when he saw it could hold no more, Bishop Hatto, he made fast the door, and while for mercy on Christ they call, he set fire to the barn and burned them all. If faith, tis an excellent bonfire, quoth he, and the country is greatly obliged to me for ridding it in these times forlorn of rats that only consume the corn. So then to his palace returned he, and he sat down to supper merrily, and he slept that night like an innocent man, but Bishop Hatto never slept again. In the morning as he entered the hall, where his picture hung against the wall, a sweat like death all over him came, for the rats had eaten it out of the frame. As he looked there came a man from his farm, he had a countenance white with alarm, "'My lord, I opened your granaries this morn, "'and the rats had eaten all your corn.' "'Another came running presently, "'and he was pale as pale could be. "'Fly, my lord bishop, fly,' quoth he, Ten thousand rats are coming this way. "'The lord forgive you yesterday.' "'I'll go to my town on the Rhine,' replied he. "'Tis the safest place in Germany. "'The walls are high, and the shores are steep, "'and the stream is strong, and the water deep.' Bishop Hatto fearfully hastened away, and he crossed the Rhine without delay, and reached his tower, and barred with care all windows, doors, and loopholes there. He laid him down and closed his eyes, but soon a scream made him arise. He started and saw two eyes of flame on his pillow, from whence the screaming came. He listened and looked. It was only the cat, but the bishop he grew more fearful for that, for she sat screaming, mad with fear, at the army of rats that was drawing near. For they have swum over the river so deep, and they have climbed the shore so steep, and up the tower their way is bent, to do the work for which they were sent. They are not to be told by the dozen or score, by thousands they come, and by myriads and more. Such numbers had never been heard of before, such a judgment had never been witnessed of yore. Down on his knees the bishop fell, and faster and faster his beads did tell, as, louder and louder drawing near, the gnawing of their teeth he could hear. And in at the windows, and in at the door, and through the walls, helter-skelter they pour, and down from the ceiling, and up through the floor, from the right and the left, from behind and before, and all at once to the bishop they go. They have whetted their teeth against the stones, and now they pick the bishop's bones. They gnawed the flesh from every limb, for they were sent to do judgment on him. Robert Southey End of section 43 Read by Kara Schallenberg on October 29, 2006 in Oceanside, California Every Child Should Know, edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 44, read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. 
This section contains two poems, Columbus and The Shepherd of King Admetus. Part 4 continued. Columbus. We are greatly indebted to Joaquin Miller for his Sail On, Sail On. Endurance is the watchword of the poem and the watchword of our republic. Every man to his gun. Columbus discovered America in his own mind before he realized it or proved its existence. I have often drawn a chart of Columbus's life and voyages to show what need he had of the motto, Sail On, to accomplish his end. This is one of our greatest American poems. The writer still lives in California. Behind him lay the grey Azores, behind the gates of Hercules. Before him not the ghost of shores, before him only shoreless seas. The good mate said, Now must we pray, for lo, the very stars are gone. Speak, Admiral, what shall I say? Why, say, sail on, and on. My men grow mutinous day by day, my men grow ghastly wan and weak. The stout mate thought of home, a spray of salt wave washed his swarthy cheek. What shall I say, brave admiral, if we sight naught but seas at dawn? Why, you shall say at break of day, sail on, sail on and on. They sailed and sailed as winds might blow, until at last the blanched mate said, why, now not even God would know, should I and all my men fall dead. These very winds forget their way, for God from these dread seas is gone. Now speak, brave Admiral, and say. He said, Sail on, and on. They sailed, they sailed, then spoke his mate. This mad sea shows his teeth to-night. He curls his lip, he lies in wait with lifted teeth, as if to bite. Brave Admiral, say but one word, what shall we do when hope is gone? The words leaped as a leaping sword, sail on, sail on and on. Then, pale and worn, he kept his deck, and through the darkness peered that night. Ah, darkest night, and then a speck, a light, a light, a light, a light. It grew. A starlit flag unfurled, it grew to be time's burst of dawn. He gained a world, he gave that world its watchword. On and on. Joaquin Miller The Shepherd of King Admetus Once a year the children learn The Shepherd of King Admetus, which is one of the finest poems ever written as showing the possible growth of real history into mythology, the tendency of mankind to deify what is fine or sublime in human action. Not every child will learn this entire poem, because it is too long, but every child will learn the best lines in it, while the children are teaching it to me, and when I take my turn in teaching it to them. No child fails to catch the spirit and intent of the poem, and to become entirely familiar with it. There came a youth upon the earth, some thousand years ago, whose slender hands were nothing worth, whether to plough or reap or sow. Upon an empty tortoise-shell he stretched some chords and drew music that made men's bosoms swell, fearless, or brimmed their eyes with dew. Then King Admetus, one who had pure taste by right divine, decreed his singing not too bad, to hear between the cups of wine. And so, well pleased with being soothed into a sweet half-sleep, three times his kingly beard he smoothed, and made him viceroy o'er his sheep. His words were simple words enough, and yet he used them so that what in other mouths was rough, in his seemed musical and low. Men called him but a shiftless youth in whom no good they saw, and yet, unwittingly in truth, they made his careless words their law. They knew not how he learned it all, for idly, hour by hour, he sat and watched the dead leaves fall, or mused upon a common flower. It seemed the loveliness of things did teach him all their use, 
for in mere weeds and stones and springs he found a healing power profuse. Men granted that his speech was wise, but when a glance they caught of his slim grace and woman's eyes, they laughed and called him good for naught. Yet after he was dead and gone, and e'en his memory dim, earth seemed more sweet to live upon, more full of love because of him. And day by day more holy grew each spot where he had trod, till after poets only knew their first-born brother as a god. James Russell Lowell End of section 44 Read by Kara Schallenberg on October 29, 2006 in Oceanside, California Every Child Should Know Edited by Mary E. Burt Section 45 Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg This section contains just one poem How They Brought the Good News from Ghent to Aix Reader's Note This is one of my all-time favorite poems. I bumped into it in a book of poems about horses, I think, when I was a teenager, and I've loved it ever since, and I am so glad that it's included in this collection. I hope you like it as much as I do. End of the reader's note. I have an essay written by a lad of fourteen years on How They Brought the Good News from Ghent to Aix. I should judge from this essay that any boy at that age would like the poem, even if he had not himself been over the ground, as this boy had. I sprang to the stirrup, and Joris and he, I galloped, Dirk galloped, we galloped all three. Good speed, cried the watch, as the gate bolts undrew. Speed, echoed the wall to us, galloping through. Behind shut the postern, the lights sank to rest, and into the midnight we galloped abreast. Not a word to each other, we kept the great pace, neck by neck, stride by stride, never changing our place. I turned in my saddle, and made its girth tight, then shortened each stirrup and set the peak right, rebuckled the cheek strap, chained slacker the bit, nor galloped less steadily Rolland a whit. Twas moonset at starting, but while we drew near Low Karen, the cocks crew and twilight dawned clear. At Boom a great yellow star came out to sea, at Dufeld twas morning as plain as could be, and from Mecheln church steeple we heard the half chime, so Joris broke silence with. Yet there is time. At airshot up leaped of a sudden the sun, and against him the cattle stood black every one, to stare through the mist at us galloping past, and I saw my stout galloper Rolland at last with resolute shoulders each butting away the haze, as some bluff river headland its spray. And his low head and crest, just one sharp ear bent back for my voice, and the other pricked out on his track, and one eye's black intelligence, ever that glance, o'er its white edge at me, his own master askance. And the thick heavy spume flakes, which I and anon his fierce lips shook upward, in galloping on. By Hasselt Dirk groaned, and cried Joris, Stay spur, your Rose galloped bravely, the fault's not in her, we'll remember at Aix, for one heard the quick wheeze of her chest, saw the stretched neck and staggering knees and sunk tail, and horrible heave of the flank, as down on her haunches she shuddered and sank. So we were left galloping Joris and I, past Lowes and past Tongres, no cloud in the sky. The broad sun above laughed a pitiless laugh. Neath our feet broke the brittle bright stubble like chaff, till over by Dalhem a dome spire sprang white, and— Gallop, gasped Joris, for Aix is in sight. How they'll greet us! And all in a moment his roan, rolled neck and croup over, lay dead as a stone. And there was my Rolland to bear the whole weight of the news which alone could save Aix from her fate. With his nostrils like pits, full of blood to the brim, and with circles of red for his eye-socket's rim, 
Then I cast loose my buff coat, each holster let fall, shook off both my jack boots, let go belt and all, stood up in the stirrup, leaned, patted his ear, called my Roland his pet name, my horse without peer, clapped my hands, laughed and sang any noise, bad or good, till at length into Aix Roland galloped and stood. And all I remember is friends flocking round, as I sat with his head twixt my knees on the ground, and no voice but was praising this Roland of mine, as I poured down his throat our last measure of wine, which, the Burgesses voting by common consent, was no more than his due who brought good news from Ghent. Robert Browning End of section 45 Read by Kara Schallenberg on October 29, 2006 in Oceanside, California.